this this title and topic is kind of kind of you know a little little cheeky because it's you know maximizing your brain to maximize your business. Well, of course we all want to do that, right? But um, do we really know how to do that? Has anybody here, by a show of hands or by uh, a, co a comment, has anybody been told how to like actually maximize their brain and their cognitive bandwidth to build their business? Yeah, there's nobody out there really doing it. To be fair, um, and, and this is this is the problem is that we know that there are some really unique techniques and ways to do that. Now, you you might have heard of, of some of these, but there will probably be a couple of things that will also surprise you as well too. And so, just a little background on on me. Um, so I, uh, I've spent the last 10 years in practice. Uh, I have a, a specialty in neuroorthopedic clinic um, back in the States. Uh, I've, I've pretty much worked with uh, complex neurological conditions, anything ranging from concussions, strokes, brain injuries, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, uh, neurodevelopmental conditions. I mean, you name it, I've probably seen it for better, for worse. And, and what I, when I say for better, for worse, for worse, because I have seen the worst of the worst, and I hope to never have to have anyone that I care about or know deal with any of that stuff uh, because it is tragic and it is, is really sad, but for better, because when I look at what has been going on in medicine over the last few decades, I have patients that have been through, you know, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, they've been to all the major medical institutions around the world. And yet they still possess this inherent capability to and change and improve and, and, and build their brains back up to become better at whatever tasks they want to become better at. And so this really changed my perspective and continues to change my perspective about how truly limitless we are as humans. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, five foot 10 Eric, who's never played basketball before is going to go play in the NBA anytime soon. But what I'm saying is that as an entrepreneur and a business owner, our ability to improve our opportunities and our skill sets is vast. Um, and, and, you know, I love the saying, you know, uh, play your strengths and hire out your weaknesses. And I really, truly believe in that. But don't do it at the expense of your own quality of life, at your personal relationships, at your ability to actually get things done throughout the day by burning the candle at both ends. And so, you know, my focus over the last couple of years really has been not only in practice, but, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. I've seen that firsthand with my dad, my cousins, my uncles, my, my aunts who have their own companies as well, too, about how devastating, uh, you know, starting a business or having a business can be on their life. And so I don't want that to happen to you. And if there's one thing that you can take away from today that can help improve your life, then hopefully this presentation was worth it. So um, as much as I hate having to put these, you know, silly things up, which, you know, I don't even understand for the most part, all the, you know, medical and law jargon we have to, I'm not trying to establish doctor patient relationship with anybody today. I'm merely just giving, you know, education and information. Um, for those of you who want to implement any of the things we talk about today, always have a conversation with your GP or medical provider. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to you taking on that task and that role. But let, let's have a chat about what business life looks like in 2023, right? Uh, it, it can be a bit messy. Notifications, emails, wondering if chat GPT is going to upend your entire business model based off of new technologies that are advancing. I mean, we have a lot going on today. And what's really important to understand is that we're dealing with a nearly 40,000 year old brain that's stuck in the 21st century. And, and here's what I mean by that is that our brain neurologically, neuro, you know, biologically really hasn't evolved much over the last 40,000 years is the latest estimate. And so the brains that, you know, Socrates and Plato um, and even Thomas Edison had, they function in relatively the same way. Now, we have different technologies today, like a master computer inside our pocket via our cell phones, but your brain still functions the same way. You being stressed, whether there's actually a bear in the boardroom or you perceiving a stressor coming, still has the same rampant effects throughout your entire body as it did when there was actually a real threat there that was challenging your life. And so what I want you to take a look at and really think about is that, you know, business life in 2023 is moving very quickly. It's moving very fast. Things are changing very quickly. And it's really important not only to keep your feet on the ground, but to make sure that you can, you can sustain and endure the, the long road to entrepreneurism. And, and for those who think they're going to start a business and immediately you know, have the hockey stick growth pattern, um, unfortunately, you are very few far and in between for that to actually happen. And I think what's amazing about this group, and Ollie and I had a great conversation about this yesterday, is that 
having the peer support system that Startup to Standup has provided so many founders throughout this entire process is so key for staying mentally and, and, and you know, emotionally stable. But there are a lot of things that we can actually do outside of our peer and support groups to help ourselves. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to understanding the brain, right? So this brain weighs three pounds, about, you know, seven kilograms. This brain at one point, believe it or not, actually got to name itself. This brain lives inside your skull and controls every single process and system and thought and emotion and feeling and function that you have inside your body. Yet there's a majority of things that you don't have to think about. How many of you are thinking about balancing your blood sugar right now? No, you shouldn't. How many of you are thinking about how to distress and extend your diaphragm to breathe properly to get enough oxygen going upstairs? No, you shouldn't have to do that. There are a lot of things that we take for granted that our brain performs for us, that it, it controls, that we shouldn't have to think about. And that's a really good thing. The problem is that when something happens to your body, to your brain, to, to something traumatic, like we'll say an auto accident or maybe a brain injury, things change. Now your brain interprets your environment differently. Maybe now you go into a big box store and now you feel a little dizzy or you're on a computer screen and you're like, man, why do I have such a splitting headache? There are a lot of things that your brain controls. And what's amazing about that is your brain is always changing. We used to think back in the 30s and 40s that once you go through adolescence and puberty, you're kind of just stuck with the, with the software that you've got. Well, what's amazing about knowing about neuroscience today is that your brain is constantly changing. Your brain is always evolving. Now, this inherent you know, term we've coined as neuroplasticity is really powerful, but that's for better, but also for worse. For better, meaning that until the day you die, you can learn to you know, play the guitar or pick up something new and acquire a new skill set. But for worse is also in the same way of saying, well, what about that bad habit that started off in college that you just can't get rid of now that you're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s? What about that chronic pain that you had in your low back? And now all of a sudden your back's on fire and now your leg hurts and now you can't move as well. That's still neuroplasticity. It's just working in a negative way. And so what I want to challenge today is that there are so many ways for us to change and modify and manipulate our brain and our, our nervous system. It's just understanding some of these core principles about how do we change the brain for better and not for worse? And as an entrepreneur and as a founder, how can I utilize my brain, the true OG computer that we are all equipped with? How can we help our brains improve and how can we maximize our brain to actually maximize our business and our endeavors that we're pursuing with our companies? And here's the thing, it's completely possible. And I love this Einstein quote, that the problems cannot be solved by the same thinking that created them. So, you know, the whole hustle mentality that we kind of have over the last couple of years, this burning the candle at both ends, the mentality of I'll sleep when I'm dead, the mentality of, oh, I'm gonna put in, you know, 14, 18, 20 hour days. I hope to debunk a lot of that to show that not only does that not work, but more importantly too, you're actually accelerating degradation of the brain. You're actually accelerating the, the brain's ability to be able to execute on the same tasks that you're trying to actually build and execute on in the first place. And it, and it really, at the end of the day, it all comes down to building habits of success. Now, there are endless books written about forming habits and building habits and trying to change yourself and get to be you know, to a specific level or get to be a better version of yourself. And, and what's cool with that is there are a lot of ways to do that. But I think the biggest thing is that you just need to start. And that doesn't mean you need to do a complete overhaul of your life and your diet and get 10 hours of sleep a night. You just need to start with one thing. For those who are really interested in looking into habits and habits of success specifically, James Clear wrote a great book called Atomic Habits. And for those of you who have read it, I'm sure you can attest to, to the efficacy of how great that book was. But for those of you who haven't, James Clear essentially comes down and, and, and creates a situation where he talks about creating really, really small changes in your life. And over time, how those compound effects, that 1% change day over day, can equate to massive changes in success over a lifetime. Now, what's beautiful about that is what are you doing? Well, you're, you're, you're actively changing your brain. You're actively changing your brain's ability to execute on tasks that you deem as important. And, and what's, what's really interesting as we start digging into a lot of this is that there are a lot of fundamental things that we know that we should do, 
but we don't understand why we should do them. I mean, everyone knows that we need to exercise, but why is exercise important? Sure, when we want to lose weight, yeah, we know exercise is probably good for us to get out and enjoy nature, but why is exercise important? Well, I'll put it this way. There's a reason babies move in the womb. There's a reason that we base childhood development off of motor milestones of babies going from laying on their back and on their tummy to now getting head posture. Now maybe they're moving and wiggling and turning over a bit. Now they're starting to crawl. Maybe they start to get on their hands and knees. Maybe they start walking from time to time. There's a reason that we base motor milestones off of movement because it's fundamental for our brains. And what's even more impactful is that exercise is one of the best ways to light up your brain like a Christmas tree. Exercise is also one of the best ways to calm down your nervous system and improve cognitive function. If you could bottle up the benefits of physical exercise, and I'm not talking like a CrossFit workout or like an ultra marathon, I'm talking about 20 to 30 minutes of low grade walking. And that's it. 20 to 30 minutes of low grade walking. If we could bottle up the benefits of that, in my opinion, we could probably knock off 90 to 95% of the pharmaceuticals on the market today. And what they're touting, there's a great article that came out of Australia. They're utilizing exercise as the primary intervention for chronic depression and anxiety because of how powerful exercise can be in calming down the brain, enhancing cognitive function, and improving our ability just to think clearly. And, and I love the concept that objects in motion stay in motion. As an entrepreneur and a business owner, the last thing you want to do is take a step back. The last thing you want to do is take a sick day or a sick week or a sick month because you're run down, you're exhausted, you can't make decisions, you're stressed out, like you're not getting any sleep anymore. And so one of the simplest things that I've started to implement and that I've, I've had a lot of conversations with entrepreneurs is taking walks. I don't need you to go to the gym, although I'd love for you to. I don't need you to go play, you know, an hour's worth of tennis, although I think that that would be really healthy for your business, as weird as that sounds, but just take a 10, 20 minute walk. When I have meetings for two, three hours, the longest I'll go is 90 minutes or maybe even 120 minutes before I actually take a break in my schedule. And I literally plan this out for me just to take a walk around the block. 10 minutes of you moving throughout the day can have a massive impact because it allows your nervous system to reset. It also enhances blood flow to your brain and allows you to have more activity in the front part of your brain, your frontal lobe, the CEO part of your brain, to optimize your ability to make really good decisions. And so while movement is kind of cliche, what I'm going to tell you is that it's fundamental. And at the end of the day, movement is actually the language of the brain. There's no way around it. Now, what's difficult is that when we're not moving, we're not activating our brains as much as we could. Think if you weren't activating your computer in some way, shape, or form, or if you forgot to update your software for a year or two, what would happen? Well, things might slow down. The computer would still work, but maybe it wouldn't work as well. Maybe lag times would be longer. Maybe it'd be more difficult to be able to have streaming services or have that conversation with a friend. Think about the computer that you had from day one, the brain. And utilizing movement can be a massive way to optimize your ability to be successful at what you're trying to do. On top of that, why do they tell us to eat healthy? We really know why. I mean, outside of balancing your blood sugars, anybody really understood why eating healthy really helps us? I heard an interesting step the other day. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that you need to be in a caloric deficit to lose weight. And while there's, there's a decent amount of evidence to prove that, um, eating your food in different sequences can actually have a massive effect and change on the, on your ability to actually lose weight. And here's what I mean. Um, you have trillions of gut microbes inside your, inside your intestinal tract. Um, your gut microbes outnumber your human cells about 10 or 20 to one, meaning that you are actually far less human than you are bacterial or microbe based. Something to, that's really kind of difficult for us to wrap our heads around, but your food that you eat actually feeds the microbes in your gut. The microbes in your gut produce all the beneficial molecules and ingredients that you absorb. And then we attribute to health, right? Antioxidants, uh, short chain fatty acids. I mean, really healthy molecules that we need that we attribute to being healthy. Things that will help us balance our cholesterol, lower our blood sugar, improve inflammatory markers. But what I'm gonna tell you is that your gut is directly tied to your brain. And, and we know this now. This is actually the model of understanding neurodegenerative conditions. They look at Parkinson's. 
And Parkinson's, we take a look at Parkinson's, it's a neurologically based disorder. You get the tremors, you got changes in facial expression. One of the first symptoms that precedes any neurological function in Parkinson's by about 10 to 15 years is constipation. Constipation, a lack of gut function or a lack of gut movement, is something that is a preceding symptom for neurological deficits. Well, why is that? If you have a healthy gut, you most likely have a healthy brain. But if you don't have a healthy gut, then you probably aren't going to have a healthy brain. And so while we're looking at this with Parkinson's, there's also evidence for multiple sclerosis. There's also evidence for Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's today is actually being looked at as the type 3 diabetes, meaning that if you have unstable blood sugar or if you have blood sugar instability or blood sugar issues throughout the day, most likely you are going to be more prone. I'm not saying it's going to be causative, but you're more prone to having issues neurologically. So what can we do, right? We may be intermittent fasts. Maybe we don't have breakfast in the mornings at times to optimize our blood sugar levels. We maybe think about the foods that we're eating. Well, absolutely. Getting rid of things that are going to cause inflammation, maybe not having the quick meal, but having a meal at home that you know the ingredients and you can, you can cook yourself. These things are really important. And so we also know the sequence of you eating your foods can have an impact. And so fiber is a massive component of longevity and quality of life. Fiber also feeds these gut microbiome, these gut microbes that'll help you produce really healthy fats to take care of your brain. We know if you have a, a dish, let's say you have a dish of food, right? And you have sweet potatoes, you have broccoli, and you have salmon on that dish. The order that you eat those foods will actually change and dictate the amount of calories and the way your brain and body processes those foods. So here's what I'll tell you is most people want to go to the sweet things first, right? If you're a kid, you want to go to the sugary things right away. But if you eat the fibrous foods first, meaning that you eat your vegetables first, veggies are full of fiber. They actually expand and fill up inside your intestinal tract and make you feel full faster. And so if you eat the fiber first, not only do you get the benefits of the fiber to feed your gut microbiome, but you feel full right away and you won't eat as much food later on, which is a benefit. But if you eat the fiber first, and then you sequentially go to eating the proteins and the fats first. So let's say that's the salmon on the plate. Not only will you absorb those fats and proteins and not spike your blood sugar as quickly, but now you want to get to the sweet potatoes that are a little bit higher in, in sugar and a little less in fiber. A, you're not going to eat as much, but B, you're actually not going to spike your blood sugar as much either. On top of that, when you eat those foods later, you're actually not going to have as much absorption of those calories. You're going to have less absorption. You're not going to have as much weight put on, metaphorically speaking, if you change that mentality. Here's something they'll actually tell you as well, too, is that there's a lot of research coming out talking about aging and disease. They're looking at aging no longer as something that's inevitable for all of us. They're looking at aging as an actual disease, meaning that we think in some way, shape, or form that we can actually reverse aging. David Sinclair at Harvard University is doing this with rats. And what they're doing is they're putting rats under unique situations where they're actually fasting. Well, what does fasting look like? Fasting is essentially saying you're not eating food and you're having a caloric deficit. Fasting looks like what you do every night when you go to sleep. How many of you are eating when you're sleeping, right? Nobody. Now that's a really healthy thing. It's a healthy adaption that our brains and bodies use as a way to help us kind of reset some of these models. It's really powerful for us. And so nutrition and even changing your diet can have massive consequences and outcomes for helping you improve your cognitive processing and just feeling like you have more energy throughout the day as well. Kind of powerful. How about hydration? We know we need to drink water. Why? Well, your brain is 73% water. A change in 2% of your body's, so a 2% change in your hydration status can yield cognitive deficits. Think about that for a second, right? Even though you're drinking coffee, you're having tea, maybe you have a pint at the end of the night, changes in cognitive deficits can occur when you start having moments of dehydration. And, and, and this is massively impo impactful for us because this is something we take for granted, right? We all have water accessible to us. So yeah, you need to get your eight to 10 glasses of water a day. More importantly too, what's that probably going to do? It's going to make you get up and go to the bathroom. Maybe it's going to make you take a break from time to time. Your hydration status is immediately tied to cognitive processing. Don't underestimate how impactful drinking water can be. 
how many of us here feel like we actually get enough sleep throughout the night? Go ahead and put your hands up for me. Okay, I can't see everybody, but I'm gonna make the assumption that it's probably not everybody. Um, this is a massive problem for us, not only as a society, but especially as entrepreneurs. Okay, one in three people globally suffer from something called sleep, um, is from insomnia. Okay, insomnia can can look like a couple of things, but insomnia essentially, from, from the medical de definition is that insomnia is described either as an inability to get to sleep, an inability to stay asleep, or the feelings of like, you just had a full night's rest and you don't feel like you've actually been well rested or you have enough energy to be able to last throughout the day. Sleep is massively restorative for us. And there is a reason from an evolutionary standpoint that we sleep a third of our lives away. Sleep allows us to consolidate memories. So think of all the things that you did yesterday. And now think about what you remember from yesterday, right? How many remember the, the breakfast you had on Monday morning? Okay, because your brain probably didn't deem that important unless it was your birthday or unless it was with somebody that you really enjoyed time with. It's not efficient for the brain to lay down those memories because you only have so much kind of bandwidth to be able to do that. Sleep not only consolidates memories, but sleep's super important for allowing us to take out the day's trash. One of the neurodegenerative models that we're actually looking at uh, in the sleep space is the fact that your brain is suspended in fluid and it's, it's, it's called um, cerebral spinal fluid. This fluid bathes your skull and is, is kind of responsible for helping your brain, you know, stay afloat, be absorbed in nutrients and, and, and really just kind of bathe it in a lot of really healthy chemicals. That cerebral spinal fluid, when you're sleeping, moves two to three or four times even faster while you're sleeping than when you're awake. And the latest theories are that that velocity, that movement, that turbulence is actually taking out the, the day's garbage and getting rid of it. People who don't sleep well don't have that opportunity to take out the day's trash. But what happens when you have trash that gets collected, that doesn't get collected and now it's in your garage or it stays next to the, to the side of the street, it, 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 it packs up, right? It becomes stinky. Now it starts rotting and molding. The same thing can be said about toxins, broken down proteins, things like that in the brain. Brain is not only, or sleep is not only restorative for the brain, but it's restorative for your cognitive processing. Sleep can actually help alleviate pain. People who are in chronic pain who sleep longer or change their sleep habits can actually improve their pain levels. And this is important for aging populations, but any weekend warrior who thinks that they still have what it takes to go play a football match, and then you're sore for the next couple of days. I've been there way too many times. Sleep is a, one of the most easiest things for us to implement, but the problem is we're entrepreneurs, right? And so I don't know about you, but I don't know how many countless nights I've had where I've gone to bed and immediately when I, my head hits the pillow, I'm like, I have 30 things that I have to do tomorrow. Oh, I forgot to do this, this, and this. Did I take care of payroll for, for next week? And, and it's not, it, it's easier said than done, right? But here's what I'm going to tell you is that there are ways to maximize and optimize sleep. One, exercise. Physical exercise is one of the best ways to optimize your sleep. Two, your hydration status can massively impact that. But three, We'll talk about caffeine. We'll talk about coffee. I have a slide on that in a little bit. Sleep isn't as easy as it sounds. And believe me, uh, you know, if we could all just flip a switch and sleep better, then the world would be a better place. But what I'm going to tell you is that the best intervention for sleep is actually cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's actually a lot of really cool and unique apps out there that can help people improve their quality of sleep by utilizing specific cognitive-based therapies and techniques. One of them, which is actually utilizing breathing techniques. So I can happily follow up with people on that on that point, but um, sleep is restorative and powerful. The moment that you start losing sleep is the moment your brain starts to go after itself. Once we get through sleep, let's talk about coffee, okay? I love coffee. I'm a massive caffeine fiend. But what I realized years ago is that caffeine was one of the biggest reasons why I wasn't sleeping well. Caffeine has a six-hour half-life. So here's what that means. If you have a cup of coffee at noon, at 6 p.m. that night, half of the caffeine content in that cup of coffee is still running throughout your brain and bloodstream, okay? So what does that mean? At midnight, you still have one-fourth of the amount of caffeine still in your bloodstream floating around. So uh, Dr. Jonathan had a question on Wednesday. Someone said, I stopped drinking caffeine at five o'clock. And he said, well, that's, that's way too late. Here's what I'll tell you is I think that noon in some way, shape, or form for some people might still be too late to be drinking coffee. 
to be fair, drinking coffee too early in the morning can be an issue as well too, because in the morning, your cortisol levels are high. And as they start dropping off while you're awake, caffeine immediately spikes your cortisol levels to go back up. Well, cortisol is a stress response. It's a stress hormone we attribute it to. That's not always, it's, it's kind of a false uh, connotation because it's in, a, in, a, in some ways it's a good stressor, right? So uh, let's say you just get a big deal. Cortisol is going to light your brain up like a Christmas tree. That's a really good stressor. But the chronic, long, unenduring cortisol release is where we get into problems. And caffeine can mitigate that and push that system further down the line when we have too much of it. And so what I'm going to tell you is use your caffeine wisely, right? If you need caffeine to help you in the morning to get awake, use it like around 10 or 11. That's where you're going to get the max benefits, not only for the rest of the day, but for your sleep patterns and for allowing you to get restorative energy uh, throughout the next day as well too. Now we live in a caffeine focused society and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but it doesn't follow the properties of where current neuroscience understands these molecules today. And caffeine is kind of a false, um, it's kind of a false narrative because all caffeine does is trick your brain into thinking you have more energy, but it actually doesn't give you more energy. The caffeine molecule actually occupies adenosine receptor sites. It doesn't produce more energy in any way, shape, or form. It just gives you a heightened sense of alertness. And while that's not wrong, what I'm going to tell you is that there might be other ways to be able to get that. And what do you think they are? It's probably by taking a short walk, making sure you're hydrated. If you have to take a cat nap during the day, take one for 20 minutes. That's not going to hurt you. But here's what I want to say is that new habits, regardless of what they look like, are going to result in a new brain. Every single one of us here on this call has a brain that is unique, that is able to change and adapt and grow. And as an entrepreneur, being able to mitigate and handle stress, regardless of what stressor comes your way, the goal is to build up your bandwidth to take as many hits throughout the day without affecting your quality of life. And what we know about the brain is that we still don't know a ton about the brain. And as much as we think we know about neuroscience and understanding the brain and body, there's still so much to be said about that. So here's what I want to empower everybody on this call to do is I, I want you to take a look in the mirror and say, is there something that maybe I could do better? Is there something maybe that I could have a conversation with a colleague or a peer to maybe help keep me accountable? Are there things that maybe I can do with my partner that can help me live a better life and be a little bit more effective and efficient? Because at the end of the day, all of this is going to manifest with your business. And at the end of the day, the quality of your brain will result in the quality of your business. And I'm not saying that you have to have a high IQ to be able to start a startup, but what I'm going to tell you is that it's going to have a massive impact on that. So I hope you're able to take away a couple of things uh, from this presentation. Uh, it's always difficult to take <laughs> decades worth of practice to try and put it into you know, a 20, 30 minute presentation. But I kind of would like to open the floor up for questions if people have them. I know that there are a couple of things in the chat that I probably didn't get to. So um, yeah, I guess I'll just open the floor up and uh, I'd like to hear any comments or suggestions from people if that's, uh, if that's open. Of course, uh, Eric, that was really good. And uh, I'm gonna first thing I'm gonna do is is play the recording of this to my wife, who's gonna help me uh, try and get on the right lines because I'm I'm a uh, a caffeine addict um, and it's ridiculous. It's getting beyond the joke. So thanks, Eric. Um, any questions for Eric? Any any um, points anyone would like to raise um, whilst we've got Eric with us this morning? Damien. Why is not so much a question? It's just from experiences, really. And perhaps you've got something after I've said what I say. But uh, that's been fabulous, uh, Eric. Really, really sat on to it. Over the, last, over the last few years, I've had a few health issues. Not all my fault. In fact, none of my fault. Um, one was a mini stroke or a TIA, as it's known in the medical industry, due to a, a whiplash incident three years earlier to it. Just took three years to, to come through. And... Uh, and uh, caused me a little bit of brain damage, which amazingly the brain fixes itself, which I find fascinating. Um, no, well. It is an amazing tool, isn't it? Um, I learned an awful lot about my brain and body, having spent eight days in hospital trying to work out with a consultant what was going mm. on with a dissection and then right to my, right to my brain. Um, and, um, and it is amazing and all the scans and everything I had, but it, 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 it did start to make me think differently about what I put in my body. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you do because you've got I've got one less archery working at the four I've got two but before it goes off to so um it makes you just think differently about things so I've been doing that a lot over the last two three years and then last year I caught sepsis again unfortunate and, and nearly passed away and um and that talking about the gut and how that works and I actually understand what sepsis was I thought it was something in its own right but it, it's not it's just the body's way of trying to get rid of a problem in an area and um and it's an amazing, your body's an amazing tool that deals with things. And, yeah. and, and, and what I learned was um, like antibiotics can't fight it. It's your own immune system that fights it. And antibiotics mm -hmm. help your body to get better, to get the immune system to fight it. It's just all amazing. Um, but it, these experiences, I'm sure people got their own, do make you look at uh, the parts of your body and that differently. The point really I want to make though is how do you learn, how do you get people to, how do you educate these things, get people to want to even learn these things until they have a personal experience because I, I do find that I've always been, I've always had, I've always done fitness, CrossFit, I've been a cyclist since I was 18. I've done fitness because I enjoy it and I know it's healthy. Yeah. When you start talking about what you're talking about, the link between the brain and the body, I don't, I don't think I've learned as much of that than I have since I've experienced problems. Yeah. Which is a shame. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's how do you get these kind of messages out there without it being confused whether decaf's good or caffeine's good because you get every message going under the sun. Yeah. And, uh, and um, how do you get that message across to people that um, that haven't heard about it? Do you know I mean, haven't experienced it. Yeah, great question. Well, first, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I think, I think it is very difficult if you haven't gone through a specific experience to really have that emotional tag, right? Like, um, we all know people who have anxiety, but the moment that you feel that anxiety, you're kind of like, okay, I get it, right? And what, what I'll tell you, Damien, is the reason I got into neuroscience is because I was a patient first, I was a doctor second, and I'm an advocate third, right? So I've played football and ice hockey my entire life. I'm 5'10", not a big guy. I've, I've had my bell rung. And so for me, the, the, whole, the whole endeavor has been, how can, I, how can I keep my brain healthy and young? I saw my grandfather pass away from Alzheimer's. Um, and that was one of the most difficult things in my life to witness, especially since I saw the massive shifts in his life and his memory and his inability to even remember my name at one point. And so, you know, th this is the whole catch 22, right? Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, and, and we as humans are, are really good at self justification or being able to say that will never happen to me that, you know, I'm not going to be that statistic until we are. And, and I'm not saying that that we're wrong or that we're inherently broken, but I, I think this is one of the reasons why I, I enjoy speaking to, to groups and having discussions like this is that even if there was one thing today that somebody takes away and they're like, this is interesting, they're on that gradual path of learning and growing and acquiring some sort of information that might change their life. And whether it's in health or whether it's psychology or whether it's in business, it's the same reason why you start up to stand up exists is that we're here to help founders with you know, hiring and fundraising and having discussions about, you know, product market fit, you know, they're, they're no different than, than any other sphere. And so um, if I had the magic wand to be able to say, hey, everybody should take a, a walk a day and, and be able to take care of their gut, I would have, I would have posed that years ago. Um, I think over time, it's just making sure that this is something that we continue to talk about and it becomes more normal and, and people really get an opportunity to realize that health is in their hands at every day. So thank you for those comments. I appreciate that. Great uh, question, uh, Damien. Um, Elena? Hi, Eric. Thanks for that. That's been really interesting. I've made a ton of notes on what things you've been saying. Um, one of the things I've been trying to work on at the moment is my sleep because my sleep is rubbish and I know it sort of impacts on so many other things as well. So I've I don't do caffeine and I'm trying to exercise more and I drink a ton of water and I've tried all the sleep hygiene things as well but I'm intrigued about the CBT you mentioned would you yeah. be able to tell us a bit more about that please yeah yeah absolutely so so and Eleanor I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you have like you had said you have done uh, a lot of the sleep hygiene things and what does that mean for those who maybe aren't aware of that <clears throat> sleep hygiene is essentially saying listen you know an hour before you go to bed <clears throat> Dr. Daniel touched on a couple of these on Wednesday um, you know don't look at a bright light bright light essentially tells your brain to stay up. Hey, we're awake. We're doing stuff. 
um, before you go to bed, like don't exercise. Don't like light your brain up like a Christmas tree. Don't have any stress responses. You want to kind of have this like sleep glide, this glide path into your sleep. And that will allow your nervous system to become, you know, a little bit more uh, ready and prepare yourself to go into that sleep pattern. You know, the other thing too that people try is they try melatonin, they try magnesium, and, and those things can work at times. Um, but let's say you've tried all of that stuff already. Cognitive behavioral therapy sounds quite more invasive than it actually is. All that cognitive behavioral therapy entails is, is a series or a set of um, exercises that you can utilize to get your brain and nervous system to essentially be ready for sleep. And like I mentioned, one of them is breathing. So people are like, well, I breathe every day. Well, you're not wrong. But what I'm going to tell you is that when people get into these sort of breathing states where they're doing like deep belly diaphragmatic breathing exercises, for, for, for periods of time, I and mean, I'm talking maybe a couple minutes max, what you can do is you can calm your nervous system down. So, you know, if you look at the yin and the yang of your brain and your nervous system, you have a stress response, and then you have the exact opposite of that. Um, so you have this sympathetic and parasympathetic response. And they're always like, they're like two younger brothers, always butting heads. They're both always fighting, but like one will win at times and one will lose at times. What happens is that if, you're, if your sympathetic or your stress response is too high before going to sleep, it's going to take that much longer for your nervous system to calm down to even get into a sleep state. And those are the people who have problems just literally falling asleep. Now, there are different medical conditions like true sleep apnea or things along those lines where people can actually have a medical condition and problem going to sleep. And so once you've ruled those out, cognitive behavioral therapy is the first line of defense. Uh, um, and and this, is, this is published worldwide. Uh, Australia is really pushing this forward. I think there are some set standards in the UK as well, too, where even before sleep medications, which actually don't work as well as we thought that they did, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques can be really impactful. And I don't have specific examples of CBD because there are so many of them, but there are a ton of apps. There are a ton of websites. There are a lot of really good government and like uh, research-based um, entities that can provide like CBT-based services. And CBT is is relatively free from a standpoint. You can like get an app and, and do CBT therapy. So um, there's a lot of ways to play that. And so I by no means want to make any assumptions, but there's a lot of options on the table. It's just really finding what works best for you. For me, breathing has always been a big thing um, for, for myself. And so I've employed that, but you know, if you're looking to, to really get somebody to do a true assessment, like go see a CBT therapist or a psychologist, they can help you with that. Thanks, Elena. Um, great question. Yeah. Um, Damien, you. and then Neil. Hi. Complicated. We've got two Damien's in four now. <laughs> um, thank you um, for that. The presentation is amazing. I'm um, sort of uh, I love this whole subject area, and so yeah, I can't kind of get enough of it. I'm actually listening to the audiobook uh, "Out Outlive" at the moment. Uh, yeah. is that Peter Atia's book? Sorry, is that Peter Atia's book? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to find my phone to actually look it up, but I think yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and um, so uh, I just had a question around sleep because I, I feel I get enough sleep. Um, often, what happens though is I go to bed quite early. I kind of like maybe. Just, if the kids are going I'm not like you go to bed and I just end up falling asleep and then I'll often wake up kind of like around two o'clock mm -hmm. and I might be awake for a couple of hours and then I'll mm -hmm. go back to sleep so net across the whole night I get eight hours um but it's there's this kind of like chunk in the middle which I've almost kind of like surrendered to mm -hmm. and I'm like well I'm awake and I'm just going to basically go with it and you know what I try not to do obviously is kind of read my phone and stuff so I often put on like an audible or whatever but my understanding is that you know, when we were like living in kind of tribes, you know, like way back, way back when, often there was this period of time in the middle, which was kind of a social time. And people would kind of, obviously the night would run for 12 hours, basically in the dark. So people would kind of go to sleep and then, um, you know, have this kind of time where they might socialize, eat a bit of food and then go back to sleep. But, you know, I feel amazing after that second sleep. I feel like, I feel like that last kind of hour or two is so strong. You know, and I wait. If I don't get it, it's a problem, obviously. But if you know, all going well, I kind of I'm a bit awake, da 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 da, and then I end up I go back to sleep and I wake up feeling amazing. Um, and I just wondered whether there was anything around that whole like, what is you know, are the is is an ideal sleep bad? No, it's eight hours, da 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 da. Or is there sort of you know some some thought around that? And yeah, great great question. So um, 
at Nobody Studios right now, we're actively building out a predictive model uh, piece of software to help people essentially know like what time to go to sleep and how to maximize their sleep. And so we're working with a researcher out of UCLA right now, Gina, Gina Poe. Um, and if you pose that same question to her, she would still say the same thing probably is we still don't fully know. Um, and I think that's the hardest thing, right? So I just have to be honest with you. We still don't fully know. Um, theoretically speaking, we should all go to sleep and we should be sound asleep for eight hours. But we know in the middle of different cycles of, of non-REM sleep, when we're, when we're not paralyzed, we still move and toss and churn. Uh, we know that even with like uh, polysomnography studies, people still have artifacts where they'll twitch and they'll partially wake up and then go back to sleep. Um, you know, there are also, uh, if you take a look at some of the research too, looking at different types of hormones, right? So our brains and our bodies and nearly everything that we have neurologically and even metabolically is cyclic. So our gut microbiome switch, uh, from the morning to the afternoon to the evening. So do sleep hormones, there's circadian rhythms and all these rhythms are really impactful for us. Um, you know, Damien, for you, uh, waking up in the middle of the night, this is something that I really struggle with too. Um, and I've done so many things. I've, you know, exposed myself to light early in the morning to set my circadian rhythm. I have taken magnesium. I've done things like ashwagandha, which is a really important adaptogen to help you buffer stress and cortisol. And, and I'm still trying to figure that out for myself too. Um, you know, the hardest thing that we have to acknowledge is the fact that if you are an entrepreneur or business owner, sometimes your mind's just going to start wandering in the middle of the night. And if there was a switch to turn that off, I think, you know, Whoever could solve that would probably be a multi-billionaire, right? So, um, you know, what I would say for you is to continue to learn about your brain and body because what might work for me or Ollie or Hugh might not work for you, but but there can be things that can really help you with that. Um, one of the things that I love about where I'm at in my journey is my wedding ring is an aura ring. And so it's a wearable and it's tracking my REM sleep, my non-REM sleep, my activity, and it's giving me insights into my patterns and, and kind of where my brain and body are taking me for like short and long-term periods of time. So I can look back histor his historically, it's almost like doing like a PL statement for a business, right? Where are things working well? Where are things not working well? Maybe those, some of those things might help aid you in your journey on that. But, um, you know, I would continue to empower you just to continue to try new things and see what works for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I wish I had a better answer for you. Thanks, Tommy. Neil. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, great, great talk, Eric. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, now, mine, mine's a kind of shared story as well. I mean, one of the reasons I became an entrepreneur is also is is actually almost to escape from that. My um, in my old consultancy life, I had the my body caught up with me, and towards the end of the career, I basically developed epilepsy oh, wow. um, due to stress, um, and went through CBT. EMDR and just to spice it up because I always like to make things a bit more fun my last seizure <laughs> uh, during that is I whacked my head and got bleeding on the brain so that kind of um, you know kind of made it all a bit more entertaining mm -hmm. I guess the story story around how that is that you know for everybody around me thought I was really fit you know I was still running 100k a month because <laughs> I used well, to be a kind of lead, you know I would get up on my consultancy mornings go running 10k and all these kind of things and you know everybody would think it was fine and I myself thought I was fine I was just mm -hmm. tired you'd wake up you'd have coffee you 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 know then you'd get caught into the consultancy corporate life and it would be you know drinks to unwind and then it was just but there was never a pause and then you put into that you know things that happen that you don't really take time to digest you know i i lost my father 10 years ago i i you know you you you, you get married you have kids you you move house you get job changes all of these kind of things and your body when you're in that career thing doesn't get the chance to process it you just have to go right i need to get paid this month let's crack on <laughs> uh -huh. um so i guess it's kind of like more of a, a kind of story saying you know uh, don't be it's difficult to listen to your body because i had no idea that was coming Mm -hmm. um but uh but it's just um and then not to be kind of you know frightened of the cbts and even emdrs and all these kind of things because you know what you're saying is right i was also trying to work out with the eating thing because i've been reading about carb cycling and trying mm -hmm. to help the uh tr trying to help the uh, digestion with it with that way to turn the control weight but yeah anyway it's not a specific point but thank you and sharing and you know i'm just a story of you know how it can go a little bit wrong <laughs> yeah no, right. i appreciate that well and here's the thing too right um we can't blame ourselves Right. I think right. that we immediately think that there's something wrong with us or that we're doing something wrong. And, you know, <clears throat> last I checked, 
Nobody really wrote you a book on how to handle your life and how to handle the entrepreneur journey. Uh, you know, this, this wasn't something that you have a step-by-step -step process for. Um, and while we, we all signed up for it, at the end of the day, there, you know, in some way, shape or form are unfortunately trade-offs, right? And no life is perfect. No person is perfect. Um, and to be fair, we still have a lot to figure out about the brain and body. And so uh, as far as advanced as we think we are, you know, we still can't explain human consciousness, right? We, we, we didn't know that your uh, appendix actually played a role in, in, in gut microbiome and, and under, looking at and controlling different aspects of your biome uh, until, you know, years ago. We didn't know that the brain had its own, um, you know, immune system uh, that was separate from the body. So, you know, for as much as we know, we have to keep a little uh, humility as well. And who knows, maybe something I said today could be wrong next week, next month, next year with new research. So uh, you kind of have to have that slice of humble pie and say, listen, here's what we think today. We're going to do the best we can. And then and we support each other on that front. So thanks for that story. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, there's been some fabulous things put into the chat this morning as well. Some great points. Um, liking what Marcus said, I'm 64 and I still haven't cracked the sleep issue yet. Uh, yeah. so it's just the cost of what we do, unfortunately. There's so, there's so much in that. Um, but we're hoping that people come away from this morning's call with one or two things that can make a, a difference, an incremental difference. So it's, uh, you know, and, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Eric as part of our, our community. Um, and you're going to get a lot of love and big ups today, Eric. You're going to, um, because this has been fabulous. Thank you. Put it on uh, LinkedIn, how, how beneficial this session was uh, for us all um yeah really 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 good really important and thank you uh, i don't think we can ever underestimate this um the importance of this or yeah. founders uh well-being and stuff yeah and, and if there are any additional questions people have i'm an open book um yeah whether it's just talking about business or talking about health and whatnot i will never say i'm going to be your doctor but i'm happy to point you in the right direction or see if there's ways that i can provide value and um always open for a chat so thanks for thanks for giving me the opportunity to chat with everybody today. Ollie and uh, Gary, appreciate it. You're welcome. Really good. Mm -hmm.